Um, okay, so this is billed as a security talk, but it's it's really not on the level of people like Will and Matt and uh, Jared. So I wanted to kind of point that out if you're here for the hardcore uh, security content. Um, this is more layman, um, and it's more aimed at, at helping you to avoid doing kind of dumb things and helping you kind of make a case uh, to your security team when you need to think about how your release pipeline will use credentials um, in your prod environment. Um, so my name is Matt. Uh, I'm a consultant. Um, I've sort of been walking the line of a PFE over the last year as well, kind of doing both roles. Um, and I really kind of work in two areas, identity and security and cloud and data center management. Um, it was actually the original way I got into PowerShell was when I was doing a lot of kind of AD work uh, with Quest active roles. Um, my job then was uh, was really to kind of automate a lot of AD management tasks as a way to remove uh, permissions from people. And then that kind of led on to learning about aut automating and more and more tasks. Um, and the reason I kind of got motivated on that was it was a way to remove other people's admin rights as well. Um, and that kind of led me towards being a, a PowerShell MVP. Um, and then I moved into m uh, my current role about three years ago, and I've been doing a lot of kind of cloud and uh, data center things since then. Um, so this talk really kind of allows me to go back to my roots where um, my sole purpose in life was making everybody else's life a misery while protecting that the enterprise I was working for. So if you want to, um, I wanted to put this up as well to kind of uh, give you a little kind of overview of the talk um, in case you were choosing this over other talks and kind of thinking, and maybe I'll catch it later. This is your uh, uh, opportunity to leave or kind of jump around on the recording. So really what we are going to talk about today um, is it's related to the uh, scenario or project I'm, I'm working on, which is to kind of put in a release pipeline into um, a financial environment. Um, so I'm going to kind of relate uh, this to that in terms of uh, the products we're using, um, in terms of what we had to think about, in terms of where we need to think about uh, our cred use and that kind of thing. Everybody implements a release pipeline in a different way, um, in that what you actually do and the tools involved will vary everywhere, right? So I couldn't really target your world, so I'm talking about mine. Um, so with that, the talk really came about by the realization that we actually needed to handle security. Um, when you're working on kind of automating things and putting in a release uh, pipeline, you can get a little carried away with how cool things are. And, and you just kind of put it in in a very kind of uh, uh, simple way. Um, for us, we were running our build agents with our local accounts. Everything's working. Everything's good. And then you kind of realize, OK, so now we need to move this into an, an actual prod environment. We need to think about how we are going to um, allow our pipeline tools to manage our nodes 
and how we are going to keep that secure enough to please the security team because that's mainly what you're trying to do and your whole project can live or die based on whether they're happy or not it's like um appeasing i don't want to say gods because that's the the wrong term for them but uh and yeah there's some um appeasement involved and you really only have a limited opportunity to do that um as soon as you lose um your credibility with them then they kind of they can sometimes begin to shut you down so uh, you need to know what it is you're going to be doing so a little about the um so scenario that we're working with um in our release pipeline we're using tfs as our release um, mechanism and our build mechanism um, so that has build agents which will run every build every release and uh, kind of do anything they need to do it will compile moth files it uh, will publish those it will contact the various nodes and uh, and tell them and to pull their new moths and that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> and in our scenario, the the TFS build agents are manning, are managing multiple environments, and these will have their own domains. Um, and there's no trusts involved, so we needed to overcome that. Preferably not using any kind of um, uh, certificate auth because the internal uh, choice is that uh, they're wanting to use kind of usernames and passwords accounts um, so we've got the um, the trust gap we need to overcome as well and all of the build agents are running in one environment there's no uh, kind of build agents in multiple domains um, with a hook back into the TFS, everything is running from the prod environment to manage prod and test and uh, dev and um, all of that. Because the internal rules um, are that a prod account can manage other things, but if you're coming from test, say you can't go into the prod environment. So that's a bit of an overview of the scenario. So let's have a quick look at how and where we actually use our credentials. Um, like I mentioned, I'm a, a consultant and PFE. I'm not an architect, and there's many reasons for that. One of which is I'm not really very good at uh, Visio diagrams, um, but this is my crack at it. Um, if you have a look on the left, that's really uh, steps that are involved in a build or a release where we may need to use a, a credential. Um, I've marked the locks in red as where we plan to use uh, credentials into the MOF files, um, and the locks in uh, gold are where we want to use credentials to do a task like uh, publish a MOF or to connect onto a node and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and as you can tell, there's a lot of points where our build tools will need to know a username um, and password to kind of connect and to do things. I've included these certificates on there as well um, that's more for completeness, and if we had more time, we could talk about all of that. But for the purposes of this, we're, we're really only talking about the scenario where we need to pull out a username and password and use that to do something. Um, and we're overlooking the part where we need to put those into the MOF. However, it works in the same way anyway. Um, 
So that's really the scenarios that we've got. So we looked at the options that we had for where we could keep and retrieve of credentials from. And uh, the first one which came to mind was using an enterprise credential broker. Um, there's a number of tools available that are getting um, a little more kind of PowerShell support. So they're easy to integrate into your pipeline. Um, if you, some tools have um, PowerShell support from the vendor. Others have a GitHub um, project where people have taken the, the APIs and kind of and built modules around it. Um, the advice there is if you're taking a project from GitHub, of course, make sure that you know exactly how all that code works in case you're pulling out creds and kind of pushing them off elsewhere and not really knowing it. Um, but those, uh, that PowerShell support is there. The unfortunate thing for us is that in our environment, that is not an option that's really available to us. Um, there are environments within the enterprise where that is in use, but it's not one that um, we're working in right now. So that wasn't a choice. If you have it, that is by f far and away the easiest way to go. So look to leverage that where you can. The next one that we thought about was Azure Key Vault. Azure Key Vault works in the same kind of way as an enterprise credential broker, as in it will hold uh, secret variables and that kind of stuff. So you can use it to uh, retrieve usernames and passwords and that kind of stuff. Um, the, the key word that led to that being ruled out for our environment was Azure. It either needs you to have Azure or Azure Stack, which is in a TP3 now. Um, for various reasons, we have neither at the moment. So we had to rule that one out for now. The third one that I like is a TFS secret variables. And we're going to have a bit of a demo on this. And um, the demo is not going to work, uh, but here's why. So the TFS secret variables are variables where uh, the value is protected, encrypted. That's then uh, written into the database. And uh, during the runtime, the TFS build agent can retrieve the value. You can't. Um, and there are many, many blog posts online about how to keep a username and a password in a TFS variable and then how to retrieve it and use it. Um, for me, I couldn't get them to work. Um, and it might be down to how I'm doing my uh, release. I'm using a an um, open source uh, module called Saki, and I need to pass the cred into that. That's not working. But um, I've also tried it without it, and I can't get that to work either. I left it in here to show because I'm hoping that there is a TFS guy hanging around somewhere, or uh, someone will watch it and go, hey, Matt. Here's why you're getting it wrong, and email me and uh, improve my life. But uh, um, yeah, so TFS uh, secret variables allows you to uh, keep a value in a encrypted form, which only your build agents can use. So the last one that we looked at was using the built-in commandlets uh, for get credential and then converting the password into a uh, secure hash. Um, that uses the DP API, and it's limited, but it's very flexible. 
And those are contradicting terms, but what I mean by that is it's, it's uh, limited in such a way that when you create the hash, you're really creating the hash for a particular build agent account to use on that machine only. Um, so you need to create a hash for every build agent that you have that that could potentially run your uh, release. There's a way around that. and You can provide your own key for the hash to be encrypted, but then you need to protect the key, and then you're back here trying to work out the kind of chicken and egg problem, right? So um, we've actually relied on the DPAPI version to kind of do our um, encryption. So I'm on time. That's awesome. Okay. So with that, we can move on to some demo and, uh, and take a look at the various options that we've got. So now I've got to run into the other problem, trying to get my machine on the screen. If I kill that and I minimize that, let me just check. Okay. And if I bring that up, and if I do that, then everything is is good. Okay, so I have a demo project here, and I've got a number of environments um, defined for a release. I've already put my code through the build, um, so I can just kind of push that out. Um, I'm really only going to focus on one environment for now, which is our test pilot environment. So the way I've got this set up is um, we are going to go through a couple of examples of how we could be using this, um, including an example on how to use um, a username and password kept it in the plain text as well. And the reason I'm doing that is to show something that kind of cool in TFS. Um, so we'll take a look at that. Um, and the way that I've kind of I've written the demo is I've got a variable here with my scenario number, um, which matches up to a scenario for building the credential in my deploy script. So if I try and zoom in a little bit, um, so based on the scenario, uh, we'll build our credential in a different way using different uh, variable input. And then we will actually write a couple of things out to see how well protected they are within the TFS release process. So the first one I'll kick off is the ones that are not going to work, which are around using the TFS protected variables. So if you have a look in TFS, you'll see these. These are the protected or uh, secret variables. It's as uh, easy as creating something like that. You type in uh, anything you need. Once you protect it, you can only unlock it until you've actually committed that. Once you have that, if you want to get it back again, you can't. So these are pretty good, um, and I would really like to get these to work, but um, as I mentioned at the moment, they're not, but uh, let me just make sure that the right configure there. Yeah, so we are going to do scenario five first of all, which is going to just um, in my initialize script, which runs when I kick off a release, it's, it's going to pick up on that scenario, try to build my credential object from those protected variables 
and then it will pass that into a property in my actual uh, build script. Um, and that will end up populating a property up here. And it will then build our credential by just taking the past value. <clears throat> Okay, so if I just run the deployment into pilot, <clears throat> that one. So what happens is when a build agent runs, it will um, give you all of the environment variables and their values up at the top as well. And you'll notice that anything that is a protected variable will not appear here because it's hidden. But what you'll notice as well is that anything that we had that looks like a password, even though it was my plain text value, is also masked out. Yeah. Sure, okay. Um, and then... In the logs, they'll be masked as well. So there's no kind of sharing of usernames and uh, passwords there, even if you've used it as a variable name and kept it in, in plain text. That's kind of cool, right? Okay, no. <laughs> Maybe it's not. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Um, and so yeah, um, we saw there that we um, ran into a problem with our credentials. And if I ran that again um, using my other scenario, which is from protective variable scenario two, make a quick change on there, save, release, that's a built code. And we are good to go. <clears throat> we'll see the same sort of uh, thing happening. Um, I will actually share the links to the various posts of where people say this should work and here's how. So if you wanted to try it, you can go off and uh, do that. Um, and this is actually my request on the recording for some tech uh, support. So uh, if, you if you know how to get this working, then uh, you're welcome to email me. Uh, so demo, sure, why is it? My other process might have hung. I should have left that one till last. I wanted to get it out of the way. Yeah, yeah that one's still going. That's... So this should now be running. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, so we'll see the same issue here where it actually couldn't retrieve the password values I wanted. Potentially, yeah. You have, awesome then we should talk later and I'll get this working. Thank you for coming to my presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, um, so that's fine. Um, so those I can uh, get to work. So then uh, we began messing around with the um, 
get credential and uh, encrypted values. So what we've essentially done is, uh, I just abandon that one. What we've essentially done is in the variables, we, we can hop over to um, scenario one where we do a plain text. I've already covered how those values are then protected in the logs, even though they're, they're plain text. So in scenario, I think it will be three, we are going to be pulling uh, a secure hash value from the variable. So that will be this really crazy long one here. Um, and then converting that back into the password value um, and using that. So to kind of give a overview of, of how that works um, for people who may not know. And uh, I never really like live coding because I can't talk and type. So I will probably get lost somewhere along the way. But uh, essentially, if we build a credential object of whatever kind, In the password object, we now have a secure string. Uh, and we can convert from secure string to get a hash value. And every time we run that, the value will change, but we can always convert that back to a password um, and and that will be a plain text um, password as well. So if we were to do cred uh, equals new, uh, new object system.management dot automation dot ps credential That name. And there. Two secure string. We should have our credential bill, and if we uh, recover the plain text of that, which we can, we have our plain text again. Um, but this is the way that we can create the value and that can then only be reversed by the account of creating it. So what that means you need to do is on your build agent machines, um, you need to launch PowerShell as your build agent account uh, create the value and then capture that. Um, and then all that we really do when we run our our code is exactly what I just did. Um, and we'll take a quick look at how that actually comes out. Um, so if we do edit, we're going to close that with scenario three. <clears throat> <clears throat> so when we build the credential object here as well, I'm actually trying to write out what the plain text password is. So up here where we build it, um, even though the username is in plain text, it has protected that. It has shown me the plain text password value. However, if I try to output the plain text uh, command when it's the plain text password when it's a credential object, it's managed to mask that as well. 
in the logs and I'll go back to that in just a sec to show that clearly when I can kill the release off there yep yep um, so when you're using these they they're pretty well masked from from the logs and really the only people who can get to these are uh, people who have any rights over the release in TFS of course and uh, people who know the uh, TFS build agent passwords because they can then relaunch it and then recover the plain text um, and the last uh, scenario I had is pretty much a repeat of this except rather than keeping them within TFS variables you can keep them in your environment data so you can have it um, mapped here to a TFS build name and then have the username and password uh, hash in there um, and when you talk about doing this a lot of people immediately clench up and that's habit I think of it's the whole kind of worrying about oh no I'm making a password uh, value available and I'm writing it onto disk and now it's in version control and now everybody who clones that has a copy and I've lost control of the username and password um, and yes that is kind of true and no you you really need to keep it in context because even though the hash might be um, laying around there's a lot more that you need in order to actually use it and in order to actually recover the plain text anyway right you would need to know which machine it it was generated on uh, which account was used and you would need to have uh, the username and uh, password of that account as well in order to use this and probably if you're in a scenario where anybody has that you probably have much much bigger problems to worry about so it's all about kind of keeping it uh, in context and of course whether this is actually secure or not is is really relative to the environment you're working in uh, the kind of organization you're working for um, and what their sort of internal rules and and things are um, and from one environment to another how secure this is deemed will or should differ um, but that really kind of tees up the the next uh, point which I I may now actually have already covered but we'll flick through it anyway um, and that is that if you're using it in that way you you now have a bit of a circle of risk you need to manage um, which is as I pointed out a admin who knows uh, the build agent credentials and where these hashes were generated has a way to recover the plain text from multiple credentials so you need to have um, the right controls in place and uh, the right uh, process in place um, to kind of protect against that um, and I mentioned that will make a lot of kind of security teams internally usually clench up a lot because they're thinking oh no we're writing a password and a username onto the disk and it's there's a little more to it than that um, and every time I like um, every time I run into a situation like that I I'm reminded of a passage which I would like to share with you now and that is there is little point in locking your doors if you're leaving your windows 
open. And that's by me at, I'm dead on time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so the point is context. If you're leaving multiple other ways into the environment as a, a way to compromise the environment or to nick passwords and that kind of stuff, then you shouldn't really even worry about people writing usernames and passwords on a post-it note because at that point, you've kind of lost the, the battle anyway, right? A credential is, is really only as much use as it has access. So there's a lot more that you need to think about rather than just how we're hiding our usernames and passwords. Um, the one I mentioned a little while ago was around putting a lot of controls in place around who knows the passwords making sure you've got kind of check-in, check-out, regular change um, in place. Um, and, and yeah, uh, this kind of becomes a bit of a people issue as well. It's not just um, a, a thing uh, the products can solve. So you need to make sure that uh, you've got the right controls around who knows what credentials. The other thing is that you should really be using Jira for your uh, builds and your releases because with that you can ensure that any credentials that you're using have got no native um, Windows rights and they can only connect into certain endpoints and they only inherit certain uh, commands and things via those. So if you have that in place, even if uh, someone knows um, your usernames and passwords, they would need to know where they can use it. And then what they can actually do may not be all that valuable. So that's a really sort of uh, important point as well. And the third is that we're we're often used to having um, accounts that have permissions the whole time, right? So you'll have a release accounts which have local admin rights on nodes, and they'll maintain those rights even when they're not in use. If you're only doing one release a week or, or a couple per month, you should really look at integrating into your kind of change control and release process, um, a task where you actually request the rights that you need for that change. And that's also a good way to protect from accidental change anyway. If people kind of log into the TFS portal and kind of click deploy, um, at a time where the account has no rights to make a change, there's no risk there. Um, so that's kind of worth keeping in mind as well. And if you came to uh, my talk earlier this week, I showed this um, example architecture. I've actually included into that a point where we do reach out and ask for, for the rights we need. Um, when those are approved and the account has permissions, it will then continue on and actually roll out that change. So you can put in a lot of controls there. Um, there was one more point I wanted to mention as well that's important, and that's around WinRM authentication. In our release pipeline. We are making WinRM uh, connections over to the nodes we're managing, um, and we're providing a username and a password. Uh, 
rather than using the context that the build agent is running in. And so that will need you to authenticate over WinRM and a WS man. I'm happy to be corrected on this if anyone knows a little more about it than me, but to my knowledge, when you do that, if you're in the same domain, then that authentication happens over a secure channel anyway. Okay, so that's not a problem. But when you're releasing into an environment that you've got no relationship with, you'll end up falling back onto NTLM auth where you provide a hash of the username, um, of the password, which is um, proven to be quite easy to reverse. Um, and that will usually go over a HTTP uh, protocol unless you've enabled WinRM over HTTPS. And that will kind of create the channel for that NTLM auth to happen within. So this is a scenario where you might want to think about enabling WinRM over HTTPS if you're not already doing that. Um, and with that, that would allow you to actually make sure that you are connecting to the nodes that you think you are going to connect to. In our environment uh, data, we just had our computer names and IPs, and we're going to trust that that is correct. So when we reach out, whichever node we hit, we trust it. If it has a certificate, we have a way to check that that is actually the node we think it is. So uh, that is a good thing to be doing. And I've, I've kind of been toying with whether there's an opportunity. If you're having a problem with approval of HTTPS for WinRM, a number of people do. The internal security teams don't usually like uh, people using WinRM anyway, uh, for some reason, which baffles me because they'll have Linux and they'll allow SSH and it's kind of the same thing. So I'm really looking forward to when SSH is more kind of uh, properly available for PowerShell as well. And then um, maybe you can kind of piggyback onto that and the whole challenge goes away. But I've been toying with um, whether we should think about using IPsec to secure uh, the channels between the TFS nodes and uh, the nodes we're managing because most orgs usually have some kind of IP sec in place already. And if you can piggyback on that, then why not? Um, I haven't actually tried it yet. I don't know how hard it might uh, be. I just kind of wanted to share the point in case other people want to think about it and then kind of say, actually, Matt, that's really, really hard and there's no gain, so uh, carry on. <laughs> okay, so uh, just to kind of um, summarize a few keys to success, uh, pun intended, um, I often find it, it really helps to know who on the security team you you should be working with because often, and I need to say this in a nice way, but a lot of security people who who wind up in these teams are are not what uh, you would call pure security people. They haven't really worked in in the kind of hands-on role. They haven't and kind of seen a lot of the pretend risks and uh, whether they work or not. And there's a lot of kind of paper-based uh, bureaucracy. And if you can find anyone who, ha who is a little more pragmatic, latch onto that person. 
they will help you. Um, and know the controls that you need to try to meet as well and what the risks are. Usually what happens is um, security will just say uh, things like, yeah, we need to turn off this reg key on every node or we need to not allow this to happen. We need a rule in place for that. And there's no real kind of context around what they're trying to do. They've just found what it is they think they need you to change and then said change it. And that can introduce a lot of other issues as well. So rather than letting that happen, find out what it is you actually need to mitigate and then make sure that you know you're covering that. So when the kind of um, challenges and things come up, you're well prepared for that. Um, limit the credential value. I mentioned about uh, GIA, temporary permissions, all of that kind of thing. It, it sounds like really common sense, but it also sounds like a lot of hard work. But I would really encourage you to do that um, because that will protect your environment. Um, and we mentioned about making sure there's a proper process in place around who knows the build accounts and the credentials because they can potentially uh, recover any hash values you're using. And then of course, there's all the new PowerShell logging we've got. So go ahead and uh, use that and actually monitor it, read, read the logs, read what happens during a release, and then you'll know what it is you're looking for if a credential is not being used in the right way. So just to wrap up, using your credentials securely really does depend on more than just protecting the username and password. You need to think about the bigger picture, but as well, you need to make sure that your security team are also looking at the bigger picture rather than just worrying about uh, protecting the usernames and passwords. Um, and the security team, whether they're happy or they're not happy, your project pretty much lives and dies by that. Um, We've uh, mentioned about the logging, and that is very important as well because that's how you'll build trust. And then you can say, look, this is what is, what is happening um, and how we are protected. Um, and the last point I put in was around certificates, and, and I really can't remember why that's there, so uh, never mind. <laughs> okay, um, so with that, that is my work here done. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any q and I'll, I'll be around. Thanks. Before we do that, I just have to make a few announcements. Anyone who never picked up their free ebook or printed a book. If your uh, badge has a green dot or a yellow dot, uh, the yellow dot is for German, um, you can do that at the info counter until 11 a.m. sharp. Anything that's not, uh, not picked up will be freely available to anyone who wants it. So uh, gather around and kind of see who's leaving what. Um, the free conference mugs can be picked up at the booth as well from now. Uh, and there's a free Epic poster there as well um, from 12 o'clock. If you need to keep your luggage here, it's going to be in room 18. And there's a URL, um, a GitHub PSConf EU 2017, where all the presenter materials will be there shortly also. So, yeah, thank you very much for the Q&A.
My work here is done. Awesome. Now I can enjoy the rest of the conference.